Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Today we're going to talk about a number of headlines, both directly and indirectly, related to Bible prophecy, so let's dive right in. This first one is from Town Hall. It's from Jonathan Feldstein. It says, The Miraculous Return of the Red Heifer to Israel. American Airlines Flight 146 touched down in Israel's Ben Gurion Airport on time, arriving from New York's JFK Airport as one of the dozens of flights that arrive in Israel from the U.S. daily. While a regularly scheduled flight among the passengers were five whose arrival in Israel made it one of the most celebrated and certainly unique flights in Israeli history. These special passengers were traveling in the cargo section. It was the first time in nearly 2,000 years that Israel has been blessed with the presence of not just one red heifer, but five all arriving together. People who read their Bibles know that red heifers are mentioned in Numbers 19, but their significance has been shrouded for nearly 2,000 years since the destruction of the Second Temple. Jews read the verses longingly, praying for the opportunity to be able to rebuild the temple, and with it, the ritual purification from the ashes of a red heifer needed to resume the temple services. But for two millennia, the whole idea was simply a fantasy, until last year when these five red heifers were born in Texas, and now have arrived in Israel. Through a series of miracles overlaying technology and even the COVID pandemic, these five were found, checked head to toe, and remain unblemished, which qualifies them for service. They arrived not quite a year old. As long as they don't grow any white or black hairs and remain unblemished, in just over a year, they will qualify for the ritual purification process needed to resume temple service. So in reading this article, I think the author is looking forward to that. He wants to resume this temple service. A lot of people are looking to do that. All the implements are in place. If it turns out that these red heifers still qualify a year from now, and the ashes of a red heifer that meets these requirements are able to be obtained, then the only thing standing in the way of the third temple is its construction. Everything else will be available for the people who would like to do that to build it. Now, why is this of prophetic significance? This is prophetic prophesied in the Bible that we know there will be another temple because the Antichrist commits the abomination of des desolation in that temple at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. So in order for that to happen, there has to be another temple in place. So we may very well see be, be seeing the beginnings of that. Well, the beginnings have long been going on, but we're, we're seeing the latest step in that transition toward a new temple being constructed in Jerusalem and the reinstitution of sacrificial worship by the Jewish people. When exactly that will happen, I have no idea, but the Bible says it will happen again. Jesus said, Daniel said, that the Antichrist will commit this act at the midpoint of the tribulation. So we know that this must take place. Therefore, this temple is coming, and this is just the latest sign that it's coming. So we'll keep our eyes posted on this one. Next story, this is from oilprice.com. It says an oil supply shock may be imminent. It says, when chief executive of, Ar of Aramco said earlier this week that years of underinvestment had damaged the balance between supply and demand in the oil market, it should have been a wake-up call to those in decision-making positions. Instead, the Secretary General of the UN bashed the oil industry once again for feasting on record-high profits and urged governments to make them pay for this, which, of course, you know, makes them want to invest more in exploration and production, but... Back to the article. Meanwhile, OPEC's production shortfall last month reached 3.58 million barrels per day, a figure equal to some 3.5% of global demand, and the United States continued to sell oil from its str strategic petroleum reserve. That's key. These seemingly unrelated news reports do have something very important in common. Both clearly suggest a supply shortfall on a global level is imminent. 
throw in the news that Russia's oil exports could fall by some 2.4 million barrels per day after the EU embargo enters into effect in December and an oil shortage becomes more or less unavoidable. Now, in regard to that oil shortfall due to the EU embargo in December, it remains to be seen whether that will actually impact the availability of oil because Europe may not buy it, but somebody else will. There are plenty of countries that have continued to buy oil from Russia, so we'll see if that has an impact. However, tomorrow in Vienna, OPEC meets, and they are expected to cut their production anywhere from half a million to 1.5 million barrels per day. And that is in an environment where the Biden administration has been releasing 1 million barrels per day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve since March. This has led, uh, in the United States at least, gasoline prices declining from their highs from a few months ago. Certainly the, the market is different all over the world, and especially if you're in Europe, that may be different. But oil is a global market nonetheless. And at some point here in the next few weeks, and certainly after the election, the Biden administration will stop that release of a million barrels per day. So that's going to lead to a million barrels per day no longer being in the supply at a time when OPEC is planning to cut and at a time when we already have tight supplies and the investments have not been made for over a decade, the capital expenditures have not been there to explore and produce the fossil fuels we need precisely because a lot of these governments have been against it and they've been pushing for these green energy initiatives. So if all of this happens and if there is, you know, an impact from the EU embargo in December, which I question, but if there is, you're going to see a shortfall come December that's going to drive up the price of oil. Uh, significantly, and we're going to have an oil shock that's going to drop. Oil is the master resource. Energy, it, it, in, in general, is the master resource that's behind every facet of economic activity. So if that's cut short or it spikes in price, it has significant economic consequences. So we want to keep an eye on that because we've seen what is happening in Europe from energy shortfalls, and that brings us to this next story from Zero Hedge, it says shocking letter reveals UK blackout fear as natural gas supplies could be cut in an emergency. A letter from Ofgem, the UK's power regulator, warned about the significant risk of a natural gas shortage this winter because of disruptions to energy markets following the war in Ukraine and undersupply of Europe. Bloomberg Opinion's Javier Blas tweeted a photograph of the letter focusing on technical changes in the UK electricity market. Blas highlighted the critical parts of the letter in the background section with a detailed that detailed a dark and cold winter for the UK could be just ahead. Here's what Blas outlined. Due to the war in Ukraine and gas shortages in Europe, there is a significant risk that gas shortages could occur during the winter 2022-2023 in Great Britain. As a result, there is a possibility that Great Britain could enter into a gas supply emergency. In the event that Great Britain reaches stage two in this procedure, firm load shedding of gas would be applied to the largest gas users connected to the gas system. This will likely be large gas-fired power stations, which produce electricity to the National Electricity Transmission System, NETS. Bloss warned, winter is coming awfully quickly, and we are betting the house on a warmer than average season. Bloss is correct. The average UK temperatures are around 12 degrees Celsius, 53.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the peak and mean temperatures occurred in early August. Heating degree days, a measurement designed to quantify the demand for energy needed to heat a building structure, is already rising across the country, indicating the heating season has begun. Bloss concluded, maybe, 
maybe, maybe it's time for the UK government to seriously get a grip with the energy crisis and start a public campaign for energy savings before it's too late. And this is what we've been talking about, guys. The governments of Europe are not taking this seriously. They seem to think that if they pass a piece of legislation, if they try to print some currency to bail out businesses or bail out households, this will solve the problems. None of that creates energy. And in fact, it makes the situation worse because it artificially props up demand. If someone is receiving a subsidy, then they have no incentive to cut back on their use of energy. And that means they're using that energy up and the supply is very constricted. That means the supply could disappear and the energy may not be available at any price, no matter what that price is that you're willing to pay. It may not be there. And that's what Bloss is warning against here is that without some significant cutbacks and restrictions and a plan to you know, be a good steward of the energy resources they do have, there's a threat that by, before, before winter is over, the UK could run out of natural gas and we don't know where that leads. But I think it leads, I think we're heading right into a massive economic depression in Europe that's going to spill over into the whole world as a result of this energy crisis that they're trying to fix by creating a currency crisis. <laughs> None of this makes any sense, but we're heading into an economic depression. And then we, that goes right into this story also from the UK. This is from mortgage solutions and it says mortgage lenders have been removing their fixed rate deals from the market as the pound has fallen to a new low. And it goes on and it lists company after company that's taken their fixed rate mortgage products off the market. Now, for those of you who are in the United States, here, that's where I'm at. We're used to these 15, 30 year mortgages. Most people get fixed rate mortgages. But in the UK, the typical mortgage is two or five year timeframes. And so you have to refinance once that's over. Well, they're eliminating the fixed rates products because they don't know from week to week what that rate is because it's skyrocketing because of this government problem with the energy crisis that underpins their whole financial system. Again, energy is the master resource. All economic activity is dependent upon energy. So when you have a shortfall of energy, you're going to have a shortfall of economic activity. The UK and other governments that are having this problem, they're trying to fix that problem by printing currency which is just going to lead to greater inflation, which is why we are seeing the rates go up. And if those rates skyrocket, these banks could be left holding the bag. They don't want that to happen, so they're pulling their fixed rate mortgage products. So what does that mean as people in the UK have to refinance their existing mortgages and they go from rates that, I don't know, we're in the low single digits to rates that might be in the double digits? that time. What, is, what does all that mean? Are we going to then have the government print currency and provide payments to people to pay their mortgages because their mortgages are no longer affordable, just like their utilities are no longer affordable? Nothing is no longer, any affo no longer affordable, and they're trying their best to avoid a depression, but I, I think they're going to end up with the same economic depression with hyperinflation thrown on top. This is just the, uh, the total wrong decisions by these governments, and it's going to lead to a massive crisis. People in the streets, people very upset, and people looking for leaders who will tell them what they want to hear, and leaders who come forward with a solution. So again, this is leading to, I believe, a, a major crisis soon. This is from Zero Hedge. It says a banking crisis looms. It's by Tomas Malinen of the Epic Times. He says, my columns 
have turned rather apocalyptic of late, but for valid reason. Just this week, we got confirmation that our financial system is again on the brink of collapse. When the Bank of England was forced to enact, de facto, a bailout of the pension funds of the United Kingdom. It says, without the Bank of England intervention, mass insolvencies of pension funds with about $3 trillion worth of assets, and thus most likely other financial institutions, could have commenced that afternoon. So this is last week. It's obvious that if one of the major financial hubs of the world, the City of London, would face a financial panic, it would spread to the rest of the world in an instant. It looks as though the global financial system was pulled from the brink of collapse once again by central bankers. However, this was only a temporary fix, and this is what we said last week. It's now clear that an outright financial collapse threatens all Western economies, because if pension funds, often considered very dull investors because of their risk-averse investing profile, face a threat to their insolvency, it can happen to any other financial institution. I consider that the banking sector will be the next in line. And then he goes on to say, Banks are also currently being hit by heavy declines in the value of government bonds, which they use as collateral. These may easily lead to cascading losses on banks, possibly with a never-before-seen speed, size, and width. I find it hard to imagine how these developments wouldn't lead to a banking crisis, without massive intervention by governments and central banks, that is. And like I've been detailing, a banking crisis that begins in Europe won't stay there. And I don't see how this doesn't lead to a, a banking crisis no matter what they do, because again... They can intervene all, of the, all, all they want, these central banks, and they can print currency and, and bail people out, but the problem is a lack of energy. That is the problem. That's why these government bonds are declining is because they see these bailouts and the printing as what the, the politicians and the central bankers, that's what they know how to do. They know how to print that currency and to make promises to their constituents, whether it be citizens at home worried about how they're going to pay their utility bills, worried about how they're going to pay their mortgage, or whether it's big business worried about how they're going to pay their utilities, how they're going to pay for the cost of energy that's required to do business. They're going to go to bail them out as they print that currency, it devalues the purchasing power of that currency. People expect a higher rate of interest on their government debt in order to account for that. And of course, <laughs> for, for, for quite a while in the European Union, they've expected that. And what the central bank has been doing is going out and buying those government bonds to keep the yields down so that they don't have a debt crisis in Greece or a debt crisis in Italy. So they're printing more currency to buy the debt. <laughs> Can you see how this is just a Ponzi scheme that is bound to fall apart at any moment? Well, all of this government debt that has been kept artificially stable for the last decade by the European Central Bank. It's on all the balance sheets of the banks in Europe. And as that debt crashes in value, the banks become insolvent. And so we have a massive banking crisis on our hands. So he goes on, he writes, we warned already in March 2017 that the global financial system, which broke out during the 2008 financial crisis, has never really been healed. We noted that it and the global economy were kept standing merely by continuous central bank and government interventions and nearly unlimited provisions of credit. On September 28th, we got a final confirmation from the Bank of England that this truly is the case. We are in deep, deep trouble. And I would follow that by going to this Wall Street Silver tweet. It says, Credit Suisse 2033 bonds hit record lows and now trade at only 53 cents on the euro. Would you keep a large bank balance at Credit Suisse under current circumstances? And I would argue that no one in their right mind would and people are very logical, and they're going to figure this out. And they're going to figure out that the problem isn't just Credit Suisse, but the entire European banking system. 
And when that mistrust begins to increase and people start pulling their cash out of those banks, maybe trading that cash for items of real value, just as we saw in Weimar, Germany, you're looking at we're on the brink of a massive collapse in the European banking system and a huge global financial crisis as we speak with Europe as the epicenter of everything. So what does this mean? We talked about this a little bit yesterday. We've talked about this in the past. It means that we may be seeing the stage being set for the crisis, perhaps, that ends with the Antichrist coming onto the scene as the one with the solution, as the one who can tell people what they want to hear. These types of environments throughout history have been the types of environments where demagogues thrive because people want help. They are desperate. When, when people can't eat, <laughs> when people can't feed their kids, when they can't stay warm, people take desperate measures, and that's when we see revolutionary acts take place and we see sea changes you know decades happen in a matter of days and so we're going to see massive change here sometime in the near future not necessarily saying next week but the next several months the next several years we're going to see this crisis which is unavoidable at this point there is no way europe can get the energy they need for the winter in time both the Nord Stream pipelines are gone, so we're past the point where some sort of reconciliation with Russia could take place and the energy taps could turn back on. There's no way that affordable energy can, can reach the continent this winter without severe rationing, which is going to mean shutting down large parts of the European economy. And, and of course, that's already been happening as we see uh, companies that can't compete on the global mar in the global marketplace, they've just been shutting down already. So we're in a time uh, where we would expect to see major changes coming in the days ahead. And we know that we live in the season of the Lord's return, so we would expect those things to happen. So, But again, guys, our hope, our trust is placed in the Lord Jesus Christ, so there is no need to fear, there's no need to worry. In fact, we should be filled with joy for having the privilege of living in the times that so many people long to live in. And these are the times, the season of the Lord's return. He's coming, guys. He's, Jesus said, when you see all these signs, look up, your salvation draws near. So put a smile on your face. Jesus is coming. Keep doing the Lord's work. We have to run until the race is finished. So what do you think? Leave your comments below, like and share this, God willing. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.